Let's take our Bibles tonight and go to Second John. Second John. So that's that's the book right after First John. Second John. That's my help for you tonight. <laughs> but it's right near the end of the Bible. Second John. <laughs> Uh, first, second, third John, Jude, Revelation. So second John is right near the end. And uh, once you find it, we'll stand for the reading of God's word. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. For the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever, Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we, have, we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves, that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Having many things to write unto you, I write not I would not write with paper and ink, ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for the text that's before us this evening. As we consider the man who was valiant for truth this evening, Lord, I just ask, Lord, that you'll help us, Lord, to... Um, Help us to be like him. Help us, Lord, as well, to be valiant for the truth of God's word and to be the Christians that you'd have us to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please be seated. In Pilgrim's Progress, uh, John Bunyan tells the story of a man named Greatheart walking up to a man who had his sword in his hand and his face was all bloody. He came and spoke to the man and asked him, asked him about his story, and he told him of how he was a pilgrim, and along the way he had met three strangers who wanted him to join them, or else go back to where he came, or just die on the spot. But the man refused, and he grabbed out his sword, and he began to fight. He fought until the battle was won. He fought until the enemy was defeated. And who was the man? John Bunyan names him valiant for truth. He was valiant for truth. Tonight I'd like to look at in the Bible at a man who was valiant for truth. Uh, a couple Sundays ago we saw how in Jeremiah's day that not many people were valiant for truth. He says none were valiant for the truth. That as Christians we must be valiant for the truth. And tonight I, I feel impressed to remind us how important sound doctrine is, how important the truth is. You see in the text that the word truth, I believe that the word truth occurs five times and the word doctrine occurs three times as you read through these verses of these 13 verses of 2 John. It's all about the truth. It's important. It's something that needs to be remembered because we live in a day where sound doctrine is being left behind. We live in a day where people want to forget about the truth. The idea today is that doctrine divides us, so let's just forget about it. Uh, let's not talk about the things that we disagree about. Let's talk about the things that we do agree about. 
Let's fellowship based on the things that we mutually adhere to. Let's, let's get together based on the least common denominator. But what you find is over time, the least con- common denominator, denominator gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Until finally, there's not any truth left. And we need to be valiant for the truth. Not let the truth as it was in Isaiah's day, don't don't let it fall in the streets. There's one epistle in the New Testament that so obviously addresses the age, the time that we live in. It's right here, 2 John. Uh, It's just 13 verses. It's short and it's sweet. And it's written to our time. It's written to our situation And it's written by a man that I like to call valiant for truth. Valiant for truth. And it's not maybe the man that you think was valiant for truth when you think of him in the Bible. It's the Apostle John, of course. It's the second epistle of John. John is the author. He's the human penman uh, of this epistle. And John is not known of as the disciple that was valiant for truth, although he was valiant in that he wanted to call down fire from heaven on the Samaritans at one point. So you can think of him being valiant a little bit, but you don't think of John as the apostle as being valiant for truth. You think of John as being the apostle of God's love. Isn't that what you think of when you think of John? Nobody in the scripture wrote more of the love of God than the apostle John. John is the one who wrote the words in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. God is love. God is love. John is the one that will tell you that. John is the one that wrote the famous verse, John 3.16. He's the penman that took those words down for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. John is called the a disciple whom Jesus loved. He's the apostle of love. And all throughout the Bible, you see him talking about love. We love him because he first loved us. Nobody was a champion of God's love like John. And so, of course, John is going to be the apostle that we go to when we want to break down the barriers between us and all get together based on love, for love's sake, for love and love alone. But if that's what you're looking for, you're not going to find it from John. John's not the one to go for it. Don't ask him for that kind of theology. John is valiant for the truth. He stood for the truth above everything else. Well, that is from Nova Scotia, Canada. But anyways, it wasn't my wife, so I'm good. <laughs> it's on silent mode now. should have a sign right at the door. When you come in the door, make sure your phone is on silent. And then in big capital letters at the end, preacher. (laughs) Make sure I get the message. But anyways, (laughs) tonight I want to consider the Apostle John who was valiant for truth. And uh, think number one of his purpose. His purpose. Uh, You see, when someone normally writes a letter, especially in the Bible, uh, they write it for a specific purpose. They're writing to tell us something. When I write a letter to someone in an email, or whatever it might be, I typically tell them almost right away why I'm writing. I'm not very chatty. I, I, my wife is the chatty one amongst us. I, I personally find it hard to you know, give all the pleasantries and the small talk and all the other kind of talk. I, I'll just tell you what I'm looking for, tell you what I need. And that gets so bad, uh, especially my dad would tell me as soon as I called the phone, what do you want? That's how he answered the phone. What do you want? What is it? <laughs> Just tell me what you want. And uh, when we call someone or talk to someone, give them a message, we have a purpose in writing the message. Well, John is no different. And when he writes the Gospels under inspiration, of course, but when he writes the Gospels, he has a, a purpose in it. He has a statement of why he's writing this letter. In the Gospel of John, he wrote it so that ye might believe on the name, of, uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in the first John, he wrote it that ye might know that ye have everlasting life. He wrote it that your joy might be full and that ye sin not. He wrote it for a number of different reasons, but there was a purpose to his writing. And there's a purpose to his letter here. 
Why is he writing to this elect lady? I believe it's just an individual lady. I, I don't believe he's writing to a, a church, as some might say, but uh, perhaps he is. It's not really something to worry about. But he's writing to the elect lady and her children, a lady and her children, whom he loves in the truth. Why is he writing to them? He says in verse 2, for the truth's sake, for the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. What's so important, John, that you sat down and write this epistle? What is it that you want to get across? What, what is it that, what, why are you writing? Why are you talking to me today? I'm here for the truth's sake. I'm here because the truth is important. I'm here because uh, for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, I need to talk to you today. I need to talk to you on his behalf because the truth is important. You notice in the text, the truth is important. He says, I, I love them in the, he says, the elect, on, elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth. That's the bond we have. It's the truth. Not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. We all, as Christians, have a love for one another in Christ, in the truth, for the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. The truth is important. The truth is important because the truth dwelleth in us. You know that as a Christian, it matters how you live. Because the truth lives in you. The truth lives in you. John lived in the day where the philosophy was it, it didn't matter how you lived, it just mattered what you believed. If you believe all right, then you'll be okay. Can I tell you that that sounds a lot like the way Christians talk today? Just believe. Just believe. And I, that is the gospel. Believe and receive. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But if you are saved, it will affect the way you live your life. There will be a change. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And the truth dwells in us. The truth. Why is the truth important? Because the truth dwells in us. And then also, the truth's important because it's the truth that will be with us forever. For the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Uh, Listen, when all is said and done, when all we have is gone, when we take our final breath and we live this world behind, the only thing that will be left is the truth. The only thing that will remain is what we find in the Word of God. Only His truth will stand the test of time. Only His truth will endure the span of eternity. Only His truth will be with us forever. And we're only saved if the truth is dwelling in us. We're only saved by God's truth. You see, in this life, that's what matters. <laughs> what matters is the truth. These other things, they're going to pass away. The world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That nothing that else that you cling to is all that important. It's material. It, it just is here for a moment and then passes away. But the truth, the word of God, the gospel, the things of God... They last forever for the truth's sake. I wonder, what are you doing for the truth's sake? What are you doing just for the sake of the gospel? What are you doing just for the sake of the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ? You see, some, someone's coined the phrase, only one life, it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. What have you done for the truth's sake lately? John sat down and wrote a letter for the truth's sake. Maybe there's someone you could write a letter to for the truth's sake. Maybe there's someone you could give a call to for the truth's sake. Maybe there's someone you could minister to for the truth's sake. Maybe there's someone you could witness to for the truth's sake. What can you do for the truth's sake? For the sake of the truth. Are we valiant for truth? John's purpose was the truth. He was writing for truth's sake. Then secondly, we see his pleasure. What gives him joy here? What, what gives him joy? Verse 3 and 4, Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ and the Son of the Father in truth and love. That's his salutation there to this lady and her children. And then he says in verse 4, 
I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. You found the children walking in truth. What gives you joy today? What makes you happy? For John, he was happy to hear of people doing what was right, to hear of people living by the book, to hear of people walking the straight and narrow way. You know, the way that we, the things that people watch on TV, the things that Christians listen to on the radios or look up on the internet or the different things that that we share maybe at the lunch table, might give the impression that what gives us joy is the bad things going on in people's lives might give the impression that what gives us joy is hearing of how somebody fell or hearing of what somebody else did or hearing of the different, uh, uh, the different terrible things that have happened. But does it give us joy to hear of those walking in truth? For John, that's what gave him joy. That's what he took pleasure in. He took pleasure as, as uh, you know, I, I, this speaks to my heart because you know what would have made me really happy about a week ago or two weeks ago, however long ago that was? The Montreal Canadiens had won the Stanley Cup. That would, have, that would have put a smile on my face. When I was a kid, I remember uh, going in grade school, in junior high, I had an English teacher that was a great teacher, and uh, she always noticed the day after Montreal got eliminated. <laughs> and she noticed it because all of a sudden she had a brand new student. <laughs> all of a sudden she had a student who would listen. <laughs> she had a student who wasn't so excited. <laughs> a student that, you know, was a little bit more mellow, a little bit more conservative, a little bit more put together. <laughs> because I got so excited about, you know, the playoffs and the Montreal Canadiens. Great joy. Yes. We get great joy from things like that, but what really ought to give us joy is being with God's people, is knowing that so-and-so. Like hearing the good news today that Burke is, you know, a guy that was struggling quite a bit while he was here, is now doing Bible studies with friends on his soccer team. Hearing things like uh, how somebody uh, somebody got saved and their life turned around and they're living for the Lord. Things like that. That's what ought to give us joy. What gives you joy today? What was John's pleasure? I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. Then thirdly, we see not just his purpose and his pleasure, but thirdly, we see his priority. His priority. What was John's priority? That's the big debate, isn't it? What was his priority? For many, the the priority is simply love. Love, 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 love. That's the priority. Verse 5, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. Well, there you have it. (laughs) That's the number one priority, is it not? That's the number one priority. His priority was love. Yeah, it was, but then we got to remember what is love. <laughs> you see, we tend to think that love is a tolerance, <laughs> that love is an acceptance. There's a church down on Oxford Street that always has this sign. It says, be you, be here, belong. <laughs> the idea that come as you are, remain as you are. Just be who you are. You're accepted here. We'll accept you no matter what. The Catholic Church across the street had a better sign. Um, what does it say? Um, come as you are, change inside. <laughs> That's a better sign, is it not? <laughs> come as you are, change inside. And uh, we think that love is acceptance, that love is tolerance, that lo- love is, uh, when we love someone, that love is compromise. No, what's love? Verse 6 tells us, and this is love, that we walk after his commandments. That's what love is. This is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. Listen, we've always thought that the priority was was our love for others, our love for men, our acceptance of men. 
But what's important is our love for Christ. That's the most important thing. Remember what he said to his disciples? If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love him, you'll obey him. If you love him, you'll walk in truth. So many people today claim to be walking in love, to be showing the love of God. But the fact is they don't know the love of God. They're not showing the love of God. They're not living by his word. They're not walking in his truth. Don't you realize that you can't have Bible love without the truth? The truth is the priority. His commandments, His word. If you don't obey His commandments, then you don't love Him. But you say, but I've accepted so and so even though they have great theological differences than me. You say, but I've, uh, but this person who uh, doesn't, you know, they don't believe the Bible, they don't trust the Bible, but I've accepted them as my brother. That's love. No, that's not love. Love is based on the truth. Love is based on the Word of God. Are you showing God your love? Is that your priority? John said, this is love that we walk after His commandments. This is the commandment. What's the commandments? It's just what the Bible says. It's the Word of God. You go through Psalm 119 and see how the word commandment is used all throughout it for the Word of God. Commandments, statutes, precepts. What God has to say. Are you walking by his word? Are you showing God your love? Then we see number four here, not just, his, not, not just his purpose, his pleasure, and his priority. But the thing with John that I love to consider right now is his perseverance. His perseverance. John was a faithful Christian. John speaks of the great danger of not being in the truth in verse 7. He says, For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Listen, we might have the tendency to think that it's based on what they say. You know, they, they might say the right things, though. I mean, I know they don't live like a Christian, but they, they say the right things. Yeah, but if they're not living the right way, then if they're not following Christ in the Bible, then odds are it's a deceiver. Odds are it's an antichrist. It's someone that's a, a denier of the Lord Jesus Christ and Antichrist. And so we need to be careful, careful of who the deceivers and those that aren't walking in truth. Verse 9 says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. And so it's, uh, it's a matter of separating from the world, separating from those that are lost when you separate from those who aren't walking in truth. And then in verse 8, in the middle of those two verses, John calls for a personal appeal. He says, look to yourselves, that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. He's not talking about losing salvation. He's talking about a full reward, about not losing our reward. He's talking to real Christians about separating from the fake, separating for the truth, so that we don't lose our reward. Listen, you've got to make sure that you stay on the side of truth. You need to make sure that you don't fall in the guy, these guys' traps, that you stay faithful. You've got to persevere for the truth's sake. You've got to be valiant for the truth. You've got to persevere. The fact is, John, he was someone who persevered, wasn't he? John is a, he's believed to be an extremely old man at the time of writing. Not extremely old, a little old. So he's, a, he's about 90 years old, so a little old. And uh, <laughs> not, not too old. But uh, <laughs> I got really in trouble there when I said extremely. That word extremely is so... Uh, it's hard to go back from that. <laughs> he, was a, he was a little bit of an older fellow when he wrote the book of Second John. Believed to be about 90 years of age or something like that. It was in 90 AD when he, they believe he wrote it. And, uh, and uh, he might have been a little younger than 90. But anyways, uh, <laughs> we're not going to go there. Uh, but he's an old man and he's lived a full life. 
and his life is filled with service to the Savior. Uh, many years have passed since the day. You know, we think of John, we think of him as a young guy, right? We think of John as the one who's out fishing with his dad. There he is, James and John, two brothers in the boat with Zebedee, their father. And our Lord walks by and sees them and calls them and says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And James and John, they leave their dad in the boat, leave their nets behind them and get out of the boat and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we think of John. We think of him as that young man who was a disciple, who, who rested on the, uh, his head on the Savior during the Last Supper. We think of John as the one who, in the, uh, who, who ran to the tomb with Peter. And you remember he tells the story how he outran Peter. Just so you know. <laughs> Just so you know, I was faster. Just so you know, I outran him. And you've got to be the younger guys, really. I mean, he says you outran him. Probably not that when they were both in their prime, he would have won the race. He must have been younger, okay? He's that young guy, that young disciple. But now a lot's happened. The book of Acts has all, all happened. It's all history now. You read the last page of the book of Acts, and Paul's there in the Roman prison, and that's years ago when John writes Second John. That, uh, that's believed to be about 25 years ago, 25 years earlier before he wrote this epistle. By this point, Paul has given his life for the Lord. By this point, Peter has given his life for the Lord. It's actually believed by this point, all of the other apostles have given their lives for the Lord. They've all passed away. John's literally the last apostle left. According to Christian tradition, according to what they say in history, is that John was the last one left. Here he is, an old man. The only one that they haven't killed, although history will tell you that they tried to kill him, that they actually had a plan and put him in a boiling cauldron is what they say they did, and that John miraculously survived. And he was an apostle, so I believe it. <laughs> I believe it's possible. And he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos when he wrote Revelation, but this is probably a, a few years before then. But he's writing this epistle as an old man, aged in years, and he's still holding on to the truth. He hasn't let it go. Watching the other ones give their lives for the truth has only made him hold on to it tighter. It's only made his zeal for it all the more. He's still valiant for truth. And yes, he's the apostle of love. Yes, he loves the Lord and he loves others, but he's not about to compromise the truth. He's seen our Savior face to face. He saw our Savior. John was the one who stood there and watched him die on Calvary's tree. As our Savior was on the cross, John, his mother stood there by and nearby, and John stood next to her. And he said to John, Behold thy mother. And he took care of Mary, the mother of the Lord. And what an example we have from John. He was valiant for the truth. He wasn't looking back. He saw the Lord, and he wasn't going to turn his back from the Savior. Christian, what about us? Are we valiant for truth? I think of Pastor Rockwood. He was valiant for truth. That's what Dan Finch would, would, would have called him on Pilgrim's Progress. He, I told you just the other day. He asked, who did Pastor Rockwood remind you of in Pilgrim's Progress? I said, I don't know, Dan, who? He said, valiant for truth. <laughs> That's Pastor Rockwood. He was valiant for truth. John was valiant for truth. We think of Paul as being valiant for truth. I wonder today, are you valiant for truth? my valiant for truth? Will you persevere? Where will you be in 10, 15, 20 years? Will you still be valiant for the truth? He was, we see his purpose, his pleasure, his priority, and his perseverance. And one more thing, we think of his principle. His principle. What was John's principle? If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. What's his principle? If they don't come in this doctrine, if they don't come with this book, if they don't come faithful to the truth, walking in truth, then don't receive him. Don't bring him in. Now, we're not talking about our relationship with unsafe people. We're not talking about our relationship necessarily with 
family members or things like that. But the context here is someone that comes alongside of you and says, I'm the same as you. I'm a Christian too. I love the Lord Jesus Christ just like you do. I, I, I'm faithful to him just like you are. I, I worship just the same as you. But they don't walk in truth. They don't, they don't obey the Bible. They don't go by the Bible. They don't practice it. They don't believe it. They don't teach it. That's not, that's not someone that you receive. That's not someone that you fellowship with. That's not someone that you partner together with. That's like Jehoshaphat partnering with Ahab. We're both descendants of Abraham. We're both children of Jacob. Let's get together, Ahab. Let's go together into battle. Let's do this together. Let's build ships together. Let's do all these things together. But that partnership failed. It did not prosper. And God came to Jehoshaphat and said, what are you doing with the ungodly? What are you doing going to war with Ahab? What are you doing partnering together with him? And although Jehoshaphat was a godly man and lived a godly life, you see that Jehoshaphat's children were far from the truth. They married the children of Ahab, and they fell into great sin and ultimately paid the price. What will you do for the truth's sake? John was a man who was valiant for truth. It's not what we think of when we think of John, is it? We think of his love, the apostle of love. He was the apostle of love, but not at the expense of truth. His purpose was for the truth's sake. His pleasure was those walking in truth. His priority was the word of God and his commandments. Love based on that. He persevered for the truth. And his principle that he lived by was to separate from those who didn't walk in the truth. I wonder, do you have that same principle? That same principle within? We make the same stand for the truth's sake. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for the text that we looked at this evening. Lord, John, such an example to us of someone who was valiant for the truth. And I pray, Lord, that we'll have the same valiance tonight, Lord, that we, won't, um, that we won't compromise, that we'll stand for the Bible, that we'll stand for the truth, and that uh, we'll reach out to this lost world based on the truth, based on the Word of God, telling them the truth about heaven and about hell and about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that we will be people of the truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.